Good morning. Again, Wayne already said, good to see everybody. House of God today. More beautiful windows we got in. They look so good, don't they? We'll really enjoy them tonight when that sun starts coming in. Mike's shaking his head back there, yeah, so that'll be a blessing. But they're looking, looking really nice, really nice. All right, Job chapter 8. If you want to be turning, that's what we got to last week, so we'll pick up there again today, Job chapter 8. We just got started into chapter 8. We looked at the first seven verses, so we'll take up Job chapter 8, verses 8 today and continue looking at uh, some of Bildad's comments that he had for Job um, here in this uh, next section here. Before we get started, we will have a word of prayer and then get back into the lesson. Mike, will you uh, open up us in prayer, please? Lord, we thank you again for this day, Lord. Give us another opportunity to come to your house and worship you. Yes, sir, Lord. I pray you for thank you, Lord, for this church. Pray, Lord, you be the Sunday school. Lord, save some of our souls today, Lord. Some of the kids, some of their own. Lord, you touch Brother Curry, Lord, still physically and spiritually. Bring that to his members what he studied this week. Pray, Lord, for all the teachers. Pray yes. for Mr. Jones. God. Pray for the bread of life. Pray for the, the, the strong service, Lord, that we have. Lord, pray, Lord, just send us God. a message, Lord. God, so do Mr. John so first labor. What's on the day? I'm worshiping God. I'm honoring all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Mike. I thank Wayne for teaching last week. Appreciate him uh, teaching. Did a great job again last week. I thought a few days ago I was going to have to call you again, Brother Wayne, but I uh, was able to, to teach today, hopefully, anyway. But thank you again, Wayne, for teaching last week. Just in the way of recap, just real quickly again, we did start talking last week about Bill Dad, uh, and he's the second of Job's three friends that came to him and try, started to try to, you know, tell him what was going on with him, why things were going on with him try to straighten him out and he was probably the second oldest of the three we talked about that simply because his name was mentioned second and he also spoke second and we talked about how he was a, a traditionalist and he based a lot of his stuff on tradition and things of the past and we'll talk about that in just a little bit today and we started he had three arguments for Job as to why things were going on in his life the way they were. And the first one we looked at last week in verses, in chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, was uh, dealing with the character of God. But, and he, but the problem with Bildad is he focused only on the judgment and the justice of God, and he left out the love and the mercy of God. We talked about that a few weeks ago, too. So that's kind of what Bildad, so far, that's what he's done here with Job in these first seven verses. So let's take up here and look at his second argument he has for Job. And we see that in chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. And let me read those uh, few verses, and then we'll get started Look at some of these verses individually. But Job chapter 8, verse number 8, Bildad says, For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon earth are a shadow. Shall not they teach thee, and tell thee, and utter words out of their mouth? So his second argument here that he has for Job is he talks about the wisdom of the past. Now remember Eliphaz, uh, in his comments to Job, he based... He based most of his thinking on a couple things. Observation, remember we, we talked about how he said, I saw this, I saw that. And he also based it on an experience he had one night, a dream, a vision or something. Uh, but Eliphaz, he, I mean, but Bildad, he's more of a traditionalist. And he looked for the wisdom, for his wisdom in the past. Verse number eight, he basically says, what do our forefathers have to say about it? And that's what he's basing everything that he's about to tell Job on is, is the past. And granted, we can learn from the past and we de do need to learn from the past. A very famous quote we've all heard says, those who don't remember the past are condemned to relive it. So the past is important. It is important that we remember the past and some of the things that have happened. But I like this comment that I read from Dr. Wearsby in the commentary I've been reading. And he says, 
the past must be a rudder to guide us and not an anchor to hold us back. You know, and that's true. Yeah, we need the past. We need to look at the past. But we don't need to let the past hold us down to be an anchor. But we need to let it guide us to the future. And we were just talking about this as we was leaving the house just this morning. And I told, I told Joseph, I said, I said, one of my comments I'm going to make is just because something was said or written years ago is no guarantee that it's actually right. And uh, well, we was talking this morning and the statement was said, um, you know how uh, the bottom of the totem pole, you know, you've heard that expressed in a lot. You know, it means like you're just on the bottom of the list and everybody else is above you. Well, actually, the bottom of the totem pole uh, garnered more respect than the top did. But, you know, we've always said that expression through the years, but it's not really true. Uh, so, you know, if you hear somebody tell you that again, you know, they feel like they're on the bottom of the totem pole, then, hey, they must be, they must be the boss and running the show. Uh, so, again, just, just kind of comical, I guess. But just because, you know, we've heard something, all, uh, granted, if, it, if it's Bible, I'm not talking about that. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of times we, we've heard things all our life, we've repeated things all our life. Well, that doesn't necessarily make it right or, or true. But that seemed to be what Bildad here was basing his arguments on. Uh, and so, but yeah, again, you know, I've mentioned already, we do need to learn from the past, but we don't need to get stuck there. And we need to move forward. But Bildad here, he makes it clear in verse number eight that, that he respected the wisdom of the former age more than his teachings of his fellow companions. Let me reread that verse number eight. He says, For I inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of the fathers. And then he goes on in verse number nine. He says, But we are of but, of but yesterday, and we know nothing. So he's saying, Yeah, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to base all my thinking and my thoughts on what's happened in the past and not necessarily what's going on today and again i'm not i'm not necessarily saying that, that that's a bad thing but we do need to be careful a lot of times about about getting stuck in in tradition and tradition's not always a bad thing either i think you know i talked a few months ago about some things that we need to hand down to our children and our grandchildren and one of those things was some of the traditions that we go through but it's we need to we need to be careful that we if it's a tradition or a preference or something like that we need to be sure and preface that kind of stuff uh if it's the word of god then yeah that's a, that's a totally different thing and you know you've also heard before and uh, we get in trouble if we say this at work somebody asks you well why why do you do it like this well that's just because that's the way we've always done it that's not something we're allowed to say at mohawk is it steve we get in trouble if we say that. I'm sure some of the other places do. But, you know, sometimes we get caught up in that. Just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't necessarily always make it right or the only way that something can be done. So I guess the, the best advice I have for you this morning is just search the Scriptures because that's what the Bible tells us to do. We, we as individuals are commanded to do that, to search the Scriptures and see if what we're being, what I'm telling you is right or what we're hearing is right, what we're hearing on the radio, different places, if it's right, we need to search the Scriptures and just stick to what the Bible says. And if we do that, then we'll, we'll be okay. But anyway, that was Bildad's second, second argument, was the wisdom of the past. And let's look at his third argument here. And it's found in uh, verses 11 through 22, uh, the rest of the chapter. So let me read those verses. Job 8, verse 11. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, Can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? Whilst it is yet in its greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish whose hope shall be cut off and whose trust shall be in a spider's web shall be a spider's web he shall lean upon his house but it shall not stand he shall hold it fast but it shall not endure he is green before the sun and his branch shooteth forth in his garden his roots are wrapped about the heap and seeth the place of stones if he destroy him from his place then it shall deny him saying i have not seen thee Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth shall others grow. 
Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers. Till he fill thy mouth with laughing and thy lips with rejoicing, they that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. So his third argument here that Bildad uses is some of the evidences of nature. And his argument was that, well, if, the, if these laws apply in nature, then they must always uh, apply to the human life as well. But that may not necessarily be the case. So let's look at, he, he mentions, he gives three examples. Again, talking about the laws of nature. Three different examples he gives here. In these verses I just read, first of all, verse number 11, he talks about the flag. Of course, the flag, he says the flag in verse number uh, 11 and also the rush. Well, that's just a bull rush, a flag, you know, that's just, well, that's just marshy grass, marshy grass, that's all that is. And he, and he says in verse number 12, and this statement is true. Remember, Bildad is like Eliphaz. Some of the things he says are true. Some of them may not be totally true. So they're this partial truth. We talk about that a lot with Eliphaz. So we have to be real careful when we're reading after Bildad and Eliphaz and Zophar here in the book of Job. But he, he says if you... It, it, without water, this grass or this bulrush is going to wither and die. Well, that's true, right? If, if you've got a plant and grass, whatever, if you don't water, it's going to wither and die. All you got to do is look out the window and you can see that. You know, no more rain than we've had. The grass is dead. And, and, you know, and that's true. But, but he's saying that that's happened to Job because he was a hypocrite. Look what he says in verse number 13. He says, So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish. So he's saying, Job, you're a hypocrite. That's why all this stuff is happening to you. Well, Bildad, he had no proof whatsoever uh, that Job was a hypocrite in any form or fashion. But that was his thinking. That's what he had came, come to believe. And so that, that's what he was telling Job. So that's one example he used uh, of nature. Then he talks about spiders in verses 14 and 15. And again, this is another statement. He, he, he says, can a, he, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, can one lean on a spider's web and be held up? Well, we know that, that that's not true. You know, a, a, per, a human anyway. You know, you, you know how it is in the mornings, especially you walk out the door. Half time, you know, you get hit in the face with spider webs and build a web there right in your front door just about every other day. But it just, you know, it just breaks and, and it tears down. Well, again, Bildad, that, that part is true. But he's saying, Job, your, con your confidence is like that. He says, uh, your, your confidence is, is weak. It's like a spider's web. And it's so weak that it's easily broken. And that's what he's, that's what he's comparing it here to uh, in the life of Job. So that's the second example in the law, uh, uh, things of concerning nature. But then he talks about uh, a garden in verses, uh, starting in verse number 16. And, and he's basically saying, again, this is, this is true. If you pull up a plant, it will die, right, because of no root system. You, you can go out here, pull up any plant, and if you, if you don't replant it or whatever, it's going to die because it doesn't have that root system. We know that's how it works. You've got to have the root system. You've got to get the nutrients out of the soil, things like that. We know how that works. So, and he's saying, he's also saying you typically don't just pull up a good plant for any reason just to destroy it. I mean, I'm not a gardener, but a lot of, a lot of y'all are. But, you know, if you had a, a nice looking plant growing out in your in your garden or flower bed or whatever, you wouldn't just go out and pull it up for no, no good reason, would you? Just so it would die? I mean, that doesn't make sense. But he's saying, apparently, Job, that's what's happened to you because verse number 20, he says, uh, Bildad is telling Job, he says, God will not cast away a perfect man. So apparently, Job, you've done something to, the co to cause your root system to be deteriorated. So he's just telling him, look, Job, you've sinned. That's why all this is going on in your life, and it's affected your root system. And that's why, seemingly, God has cast you away. Of course, we know that wasn't true. We know that God had not cast Job away. He was just allowing these sufferings, you know, come on by Satan uh, in his life. So... And that's what Bill did. That's what he was, he was thinking, and that was his opinion of the situation. And he finishes up here, verses 21 and 22, by basically saying the same thing that the Eliphaz had already told Job. said, Job, just come on. Just admit uh, that you've sinned, and then God will just he'll forgive you, and he'll make all things 
good again. It'll be just like it was in the beginning. Uh, but that's uh, not necessarily the case. Uh, and that wasn't God's plan or God's will for Job's life either. So Bildad, we see his comments here. We just finished up with those. Chapter 8, the whole chapter deals with Bildad's comments to Job and his opinion as to why things were going the way they were in Job's life. Well, now we see Job replies to Bildad in chapters 9 and chapter number 10. <clears throat> now remember, so far most of the discussions that we've, been ha that we've had have been focusing on the justice uh, or the judgment of God. Wouldn't you agree? That's what we've been, that seems like that's what's been focused on. Because that's all Eliphaz and Bildad seem to care about was that attribute of God, not the love and mercy attribute that God has. So Job, in his mind, he probably had an image uh, of, a, of a legal trial in his mind. And he thought that, well, because of God is a God of justice and judgment. He is. He felt like that, well, I, made it, I just need to take God and Satan and my friends, I just need to take them to court to try to prove my integrity. And uh, the vocabulary here in, in, verse, in chapter 9, several different verses, seems to probably indicate this, that, that that was probably what was on Job's mind. Again, I'm just speculating here, but that, that may have been what was on Job's mind. But look at some of the vocabulary here that, the, that he uses. In chapter 9, verse number 3, he uses the word contend. <coughs> and we could, we could uh, take that to mean to enter into litigation. Uh, into, into court. And in chapter 9, verse 3, again, he uses the word answer. And then also in verse number 16. And that could be to testify in court, you know, because that's what you do, right? You go to court, you're asked a question, you answer it. And then verse uh, 15, chapter number 9, he uses the word judge. And that, would, that could be uh, your opponent or maybe your accuser that was judging and, and bringing these things up to you. And then uh, verse number 19, he uses the phrase to set a time. And that could mean, uh, you know, just summon to court. Because you know how that works. So, you know, we've all been uh, summoned to court to sit on a jury. And, you know, you, you have a set time, right? They don't just send it to you and say, okay, you got to be on jury duty. Come. They give you a date and a time for you to show up. So, and then verse uh, 19 as well, he uses the word plead. And that can mean to dispute in court. You know, you plead, plead a case. You, you, you've all seen, you know, things in court. You know how the court system works. And in verse 33, he uses another interesting word. He uses the word daysman. And the, that actually means an umpire or, or uh, an arbitrator or a mediator. And so some of these, some of these uh, words here that Job uses here in chapter 9 seem to indicate that maybe, I don't know, he had to... He had this image of a legal trial in his mind. But, but either way, he, he, he asked three questions here in these two chapters, chapter 9 and, and chapter number 10. I mean, he doesn't just come out and, and ask them point blank, but you know, I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. But in uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, one of the first question he asks is, well, how can I actually be righteous before God anyway? And then the second half of chapter 9, uh, the question would be, well, how can, I, how can I meet God in court? If this is the case, if he felt like he had to take God to court to prove his integrity, how can I do that? And then chapter number 10, he asked the question again that he's already asked more than once. Why was I even born? Why all this waste? Why all this suffering? Why all these things going in my life? And these questions, all three, they actually connect because remember Job was a righteous man. Uh, we, we talked about that in chapter number one, but he felt that in order to prove that he was a righteous man, he needed to take God to court. And if he took God to court and he couldn't prove it to God, why, what was the point of all this suffering? He'd been better off if he had not been born. So these three questions here, they all, they all connect. So let's look at the first one, chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. Let me read those verses, and then we'll start looking at these. But just, just keep this, again, he doesn't specifically ask this question in any of these verses, but just keep this question in your mind while I'm reading these verses. How can I be righteous before God? And again, this is not a question of salvation, but more of a question of vindication. So Job 9, verses 1 through 13. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how shall man be just 
with God. See, that's, that's actually the question. It's not worded exactly like I did. But Verse 3, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun and it riseth not and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Ori or Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, which doth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou? If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. So uh, Job here, again, he asked the question, how can I be righteous before God? Well, he even, he states himself, look in verse number three, he says, if a man would not, and a man would not to be, be able to answer God, one of a thousand. But yet he didn't, he didn't know any other way. I mean, Job, he was at the end of his rope. He didn't know what else to do. Uh, he thought, well, I'm going to have to try to clear myself. Something's going on here. I know I, know I haven't sinned. The Bible tells us that multiple times. He said, so I've got to try to figure out what's going on. So uh, he asked, how can I be righteous before God? So that's what he says in verse number 3. But then verses 4 through 10, he seems to turn his focus uh, to God's wisdom and God's power. In other words, the, the invincibility of God. You know, God is... God is invincible, and we all know that. He has mighty power and uh, wisdom. And who, in the right mind, would even dare to go to court with one that controls the heavens, the earth, the stars, and everything else, the ones that made everything? He said, you know, who, who would even do that? Again, he felt like it's something he probably needed to do, but he's kind of asking himself these questions. And he even, uh, he even talks about four specifically here in verse number, uh, verse number nine. He mentions Arcturus. Now, how how Job knew about all this uh, these many years ago, I'm not really sure. You know, uh, I don't think we give as, as much credit to some of these guys, how smart they really were. You know, we think that we're the smart generation today, right? Uh, but some of these guys back in the day were pretty smart. They already knew this kind of stuff. And uh, again, we don't know how old the book of Job is, one of the oldest books in the Bible. Uh, but he mentions it, it was old enough that they'd already named some of these things. Arcturus is actually the fourth brightest star that we, we can see in the night sky. And then Orion, we, we've all uh, heard of you know, Orion, and it's uh, one of the most prominent constellations that we have in the night sky and the stars. And then Pleiades is actually the most obvious star cluster to the naked eye that we can see at night, and it's part of the, the Taurus constellation so again he, he mentions three here and he says you know god that made these not only these but you know hundreds and thousands of others uh you know he how how would how could i even uh, begin to try to prove my integrity to to somebody like that and then a couple more scriptures let me read what does what does isaiah say chapter 44 verse 24 he says thus saith the lord thy redeemer and he that formed thee from thy womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Amos 4, 13 says, For lo, he that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. So some other scriptures we have there talking about the wisdom, the power, the invincibility of God. So that's what he talks about here in the few, these few verses. In verse 11, he turns and his focus, he talks about the invisibility of God. We know, you know, God cannot be seen with the natural eyes. We know and we understand that. Verse number 11, what does he say? He says, Lo, he goeth by me, I see him not, he passeth on also, but I perceive him not. So he's saying, if, uh, if, if Job couldn't see God, how in the world could he get him to court anyway? So he's kind of 
Seems like he's kind of starting to question maybe some of the things he's been, he's been thinking about here. And in verses 12 and 13, he finishes up, again, talking about, God's, about some more of God's power and how all have to bow down to it. Verse 13, if God will not withdraw his anger, the proud heifers do stoop under him. So he's admitting himself that everybody's going to have to bow uh, to the power of God. So that's the first question that he talks about here. And then the second question that begins in verses 14 through 35, and I'll read the rest of those, but keep this question in mind. Uh, you know, the, the first question, you know, we talked about is how can I be righteous before God? But think about this question. How can, how can I actually meet God in court? Pretend you're Job and you ask, ask that question. Well, let's read verses 14 through 35 and then look at some of these verses individual. Job 9 verse 14, How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him, whom though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication <coughs> to my judge. If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened into my voice. For he breaketh me with a tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And if of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul, I would despise my life. This is one thing, therefore set, I said it. He destroyed the perfect and the wicked. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away and they see no good. They are passed away as the swift ships. As the eagles, they haste us to the prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself. I am afraid of all my sorrow. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. <coughs> Excuse me. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him. But it is not so with me. So again, just think of that question that Job may be asking. How can I meet God in court? And again, he felt like that he needed to do that to prove his integrity to God, to Satan, to his three friends, everybody that it was around. But he says, uh, he said, but, but what if God accepted? You know, he, he's probably not really thinking God would, but he says, what if God would? What would Job do or say then? So, you know, you've heard this a thousand times too. We need to be careful sometimes what we ask for because we may get it. Uh, so that's what Job here was saying. But he, he discusses, uh, again, this uh, how can I meet God in court question uh, by imagining uh, three different scenarios, three different situations uh, that could possibly happen if, if God said yes. And, that, and that's the first one, verses 14 through 19. He says, well, if, if God, if, if I gave out a summons to God to come to court, he came to court. If he came... He then, what, what would I say then? Verses 14 and 15, he says, how could I answer God's cross-examination? Uh, he, said, he said, I couldn't. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? <laughs> verse number 14. And then verse number 16, he says, if God should answer, uh, Job says, I, I, I probably wouldn't even really believe uh, that it was him. Uh, look what he says here in verses 16. He says, if I, had, if I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened uh, to my voice. So Job, he didn't even have the faith, seems like, to believe that if God answered him, he would even know it was him. And, but Job goes on to say in verses seven through, 17 through 19 again, he says, if, if Job, he says, if I answered wrong, he says, I'm just afraid God would inflict more suffering and, and more pain in, in my life. So he said, I'd be afraid uh, to do that well. 
And, uh, and as we'll see much later when we get into chapters 38 through 41 where God actually starts speaking and we, and, uh, we see, you know, he, he pretty much tells them who's who and, and what's what in those, verse, in those chapters. It's interesting that God asked Job 77 questions in those four chapters that we'll get to eventually. Uh, and Job couldn't answer one of them. Um, all he did was admitted his ignorance and he shut his mouth. That's what it said in Job 40, verse 3 through 5. It said, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. So again, he said, Well, well if I can get God to court, he said, I'm not going to be able to answer him anyway. He's going to ask me these questions, and I'm just a man. I'm not going to be able to answer these questions God may, put, may, may pose to me or ask me. And then a the second scenario, a situation maybe that he was probably thinking about, he said, well, if I could declare my innocence, if, if I had a day in court with God and I could declare my innocence, he said, what then? What would happen next? Verses 20 through uh, uh, 24. There was no assurance that, that God would even change, thing or change things or make all things right for Job. Uh, remember, both Eliphaz and Bildad claimed that God only rewards uh, the righteous and he judges uh, the wicked. And, you know, and, and that, that, that is, that's true, but Job says here in verse number 22, he says that sometimes that God chooses to destroy both. Verse 22, this is one thing, therefore I said it, he destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. So, you know, we don't know the mind of God. We talked about his invincibility a while ago and his wisdom and his power, but he says, even if I could prove my innocence, what, what might happen then? Because he, God can do what he want to. He can destroy the perfect, he can destroy the, the innocent as well as the wicked, whatever he wants to do. And, and then he goes on in verses 23 and, 23 and 24. Earthly speaking, he mentions that wicked judges sometimes, they condemn the righteous, uh, but they help the ungodly. I mean, he, and, and, you know, how much more is that happening in the day we live in today? Every time you turn on the news, you, you see where the, the people that are doing right and the righteous people, they're the ones that are getting in trouble and, and getting condemned for things, and the ungodly is just keeping doing the things, the ungodly things that they've always done, just continue to go on like they always have. Well, that was, apparently that was going on back in Job's day too. Uh, they were wicked judges at the time and they were condemning the righteous and they were helping the ungodly. So we'll stop here. Again, we've looked at a couple scenarios, a couple situations that Job says, if I could get God to court, you know, these are some things. Could these things happen? And, and if they did, you know, what would I do? How would I answer? So Lord willing, we'll take up here uh, next week, Job chapter 9, verse 25, Lord willing, is where we'll take up uh, next week and come back to be with us. Thank you.